Hello, Chiefs Kingdom, and welcome to the Arrowhead Kingdom Chiefs cast, live from the Wolfden. I'm Chris. And I'm Josh, and today we are talking the divisional round and previewing the championship round, which we're playing in. Big reminder that all Chiefs fans are invited to join us for game day. Visit arrowheadkingdom.org to learn more about the group and to find your local chapter. And please make sure to like, uh, share, and subscribe to our channel. Not scare, share. We'll talk about scaring later. Mm-hmm. But today we'll be talking about your Kansas City Chiefs with Brian. No, actually not with Brian. We have a special guest today. We have Titans Anthony on with us today. Hi. Welcome again, Anthony. Hey, how's it going? Tighten up, man. Tighten up. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, now's a good time as any to do a uh, sound check. Um, you can hear Anthony right correct yeah i hear okay fine. cool yeah. yeah yeah we're not supported by uh cores but if they want to we'll pick up the phone um and we are supported by a complete weddings and events your leading provider photo video or dj photo booth lighting, beer either. Yeah. and uh coordination services yeah yeah so visit them at completewedo.com all right let's uh get into stuff let's let's run down the games and we will unfortunately start with the first game that was played which was the uh titans and bengals and so I watched this game with Titans, Anthony. It was a painful one. I got to say it was a, it was a very, very painful watch. It was, it was, it was painful to watch him watch it. And I've, I, I've gone on the record multiple times. So when I was picking games this last week, I picked four of them. I, I went one for four. And so my picks were the uh, Titans over the Bengals, the Packers over the Niners, the, Bucks over the Rams and the Chiefs over the Bills. So I, I was going with ones and twos the entire way. And I would say my confidence level was Packers one, <laughs> Titans two, yeah. Chiefs three, Bucks four. That Rams one was the least surprising one for me. And I mean, Anthony and I had tickets booked to Nashville. We, yeah. we have been talking since probably week 12 when the Chiefs and the uh, Titans started trading back and forth the idea of who was going to take first when, when the chiefs went on the run and the Titans were weathering the, uh, not having Derrick Henry storm, yeah. we, we booked flights. So we were planning on being there. And, and, and so, okay, the game was painful. What was the most painful thing about that game for you watching it? Oh man. Um, well, I mean, we could start from the beginning because the first play being an interception was just a, felt like a nail in the coffin from the first quarter. And that was scary. But I think the most frustrating point for me was when you tie it up with a touchdown to their two field goals and you go for two because you got a penalty that gets you halfway to the distance of the goal. I knew from the instant that that was going to bite us in the butt. Um, It's the playoffs. I have a strong opinion that in that situation, you go for points, you go, that's your first chance to get the lead. You take it. Um, and look what it came to at the end of the game, they're, you know, down to a tie. And if they had had taken that one point, they could have simply taken a knee, run the ball down, run the run the clock down. Um, and they wouldn't have had to attack. They wouldn't have had to give up that last interception and give up a field goal. That, that could have been an instant Titans to the AFC championship. Just take your points. Don't, don't get cheeky. Don't get cheeky. So Chris, I'm really interested to see what you think about this because the comment that I made and, and I got to give him credit. He was mad about that when it happened. He was mad yeah. when they lined up. And, and my comment was, I don't even know why we're talking about this at all. Um, this, this doesn't seem like anything of a monumental decision. I kind of still felt that way at the end of the game. Um, obviously, looking at the final score, it's hard to make any kind of real argument against what he's saying. But what, what were your mm-hmm. thoughts when that was happening and at the end of the game? Yeah, when it was happening, so I was at a bar watching the Kansas Kansas State game, and of course the uh, that was a wild one too. By the way, it was. (laughs) But as it was happening, you know, one of my uh, one of our uh, fellow KU alums was asking, "He's like, why are they going for two? And I was like, "Well, it's you know they moved it up for the one yard line, and you know they've got Derrick Henry. I'm sure they got a lot of plays at the goal line to run. Um, You know, hindsight is twenty twenty for sure, and you probably, you know, I mean, this goes all the way back to, you know, when I watched college football growing up is that it seems like you have a set of rules when it comes to two point conversions early in the game versus late in the game. And, 
you know, it seems like early in the game, it's, you know, take your points while you can. And then later in the game is when you start to play um, the, I guess, the, the two-point conversion game. Would one yard have made that big of a difference? I, that's something I debate in my head, and I don't know. I was, I was a bit surprised by the play call. I told Anthony this on Sunday night. I thought, you know, why not just line up Henry and the Wildcat again? Because it didn't, you know, the Bengals had no answer for it the first time. And uh, I still have some PTSD from when he ran it against the Chiefs in the AFC Championship two years ago. That just seemed like a really effective play call. But one of my favorite um, sayings um, by Soren Petro, he's who I listen to the most on 810, is, you know, the whole fourth down, you know, going forward or the two-point conversion, it says, you know, there's, there's one component. There's the analytics but then the other component is you got to have the right play call just because um, the analytics say to go for it doesn't mean that you actually have a play that has a high, you know, you have high confidence is going to work. And that's, that's the thing that kind of kept playing through my mind after watching that play get stopped was, you know, was that really the Titans best play call in that, that spot or did they not really have one? Mm-hmm. Um and I don't know. I mean, that's, that's, you know, obviously Mike Vrabel would be able to tell that better than anybody, but, but, but yeah, there, there are definitely two parts to um, that decision. One is the analytics and the other is, do you have the ammunition to go into that with a high probability of making it? Well, cause let's, let's talk about the least analytically good fourth down play call that I think we've watched Chris uh, it's fourth and <laughs> yeah. one, and you have Chad Henney playing because Patrick Holmes is hurt. Is, yeah. is there any set of logic aside from screw him, this is what we're doing, that says roll Chad Henney out to the right and throw the ball to Tyree Kill? Anything is possible. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I, I mean, they made t shirts about that. <laughs> yeah, but, you know, that is, you, you look at the play call, how many times has that play worked out for the Chiefs? So is that, you know, that, that sprint right? Uh, throw it to Ty- I mean Tyreek the only reason why Tyreek came back into the Denver game was to run that play it seems to be a pretty sure. nails uh, play on short yardage so um, yeah I I don't know it, it's it's definitely frustrating looking back you know I I didn't think about it until you explained it to me Anthony it was like yeah I guess yeah they would have had the lead in that situation and wouldn't even had to to try and drive it down but um, yeah I do think you know, maybe as a general philosophy, maybe early in the game, it's best to take your points. Um, but, you know, I also appreciate a coach that just sticks to his guns. You know, I, I, I sing a lot of Brandon Staley's praises on here, even though he gets a lot of criticism for his um, aggressive nature on fourth down. But it, the, the man never wavers on what he does. And he, that's, you know, same thing with John Harbaugh. They, they have a mindset. The team knows the philosophy as well. It seems like they have good communication. It's not like, you know, is you know, the offense or the defense are surprised, like, you know, what is going on. They, it seems like the whole organization understands what the philosophy is and that when it comes up in, you know, fourth and ones or, hey, if we get the ball on the one with a two-point conversion, what do we, you know, is this a go or no go? See, I want to, I want to dig on that a little bit. I remember playing high school football, and there's a particular practice that I remember – we we had a new coach come in, and I can't remember if it was my sophomore or junior year, but we're running through practice, and we're going through kickoffs. And we, we ran an onside kick, and I want to say I was on the kicking team. And the dude who ended up getting the ball and getting his head knocked off got up, and he started just muttering under his breath. He's like, oh, God, you know, if we would run the right play or something like that. And the coach – Sure. In the late nineties, you know, goes over, grabs him by the face mask. Cause that was perfectly acceptable. And it's just like, whoa, number, whatever he is. Are you sitting there talking bad about my play? I call the play and you run it. And I, I, I just thinking about that right now. Um, we had no idea what the hell we were doing. You know, we, we spent an entire year and our entire life watching football and it, it's a thing when you do the kickoff, unless it's the last one when you're within three points, 
um, you, you kick the ball deep, you try and go down and hit people. And so you have the gunner whose job is to run through whatever blockers are down there 30 yards down the field. And that's the smash mouth way to do things. And we're sitting here trying to do onside kicks to throw the other team off. And there was never a time where we sat down and said, we're going to keep the other team on their heels. We're going to be on our toes. And so we're going to do things like throw these random ass uh, onside kicks. All of a sudden it's just a play call. And some dude who's a sophomore gets his head taken off by a senior and he's not happy about it. And why should he be, you know? And, uh, and, and, and that's it. I mean, it, it, it's something that you got into. I mean, the Titans didn't seem surprised that they were going for that two point conversion. And so that'll bring up my next question to Anthony. So that loss happened. Um, I don't think that you can get away from that game in a field goal game without saying whose fault was it that the Titans lost? Because I think that the Titans lost that game as much as the Bengals went out and won that game. And, you know, they have a really good rookie kicker and we might be seeing the second coming of Justin Tucker. That dude seems confident as hell. And right has been uh has been just straight up true and everything so who who was the blame against the packers but yeah oh yeah there you go (laughs) who was uh who who was who yeah we'll talk about that one so who was blame for the titans losing that game did did vrabel run a wrong game did derrick henry come back too early did they not call the right plays and you can you can go back to that Bravel thing or I'm just going to throw the elephant in the room I know this is your guy but was Tannehill just not enough and he's not enough and they need to get a new quarterback yeah so let's let's go ahead I'll, I'll jump into a little bit of this because I think there's there's plenty of blame to be thrown around now I do want to make a clarification I don't think that Vrabel is responsible for the play calling this is Todd Downing he's the offensive coordinator he's the one that's in charge of all the play play calling going in there um, I think Vrabel has been a fantastic coach on all things you know considered um, I wouldn't put much of anything that happened uh, in that game on him directly um, other than you know his name's on the product right uh, but no, Todd Downing, I think his play calling was was rough. Again, if, if that was his call to go for two, I mean, I understand it, but I think that, again, you go for points. Um, there was a play where they lined up Tannehill in a uh, shotgun position on, I think it was like fourth and one or whatever, they were going for it. And uh, it's, it's ridiculous to go for the sneak. There's no need to lose three yards for yourself on, on such a tight play. That's just absolute silliness. Um, the other thing, though, I do think, uh, again, Tannehill's not necessarily going to be an elite quarterback every single time. He's there to get the job done. Um, but when it comes to playoff times, it doesn't seem like he has the confidence to perform in that manner. Um, he takes way too many risks and then he gets like Clego clam up on it, you know. Um, doesn't think things through. He looks for his one read and that's it. And again, part of the, part of the only looking for the one read is again, the play calling by Todd Downing. He's running a lot of these scheme routes and scheme plays where you only have time to throw it to one guy. And there is, there's no opportunity to uh, go and read and, and throw to somebody else. That play is designed to just be a quick toss out because Tannehill doesn't go for the deep throws. That's not what he's there for. You know, he's a, uh, uh, I, don't know, I would call it like a mechanical quarterback in the back. He's working like gears in the back to get the ball to Derrick Henry, get the ball out really quickly. He's not going to be flitting around inside the pocket, outside the pocket and working it. So there, there's definitely some room to look for getting a better quarterback or an, an, an upper tier quarterback uh, next season. Mm-hmm. Um, and then as for Derrick Henry, I think, yeah, I think he was brought back a little early. Now, that being said, I don't think it was the wrong call. It's the playoffs and you're going up against – it's a divisional round team. Was anybody so. stopping him from coming back? Well, here, here's a different question maybe to ask if did they use him too much? Because not, I didn't watch the entire game, but the one, one play that I did catch was Devonte Foreman yes. uh, breaking off a big run. And he seemed to prove himself pretty well over the last few weeks. Absolutely. We, we got to the one seed uh, most yeah. of the, most of the way without Derrick Henry. And that's not to say anything against the King. Um, he would have no. made the journey a lot easier, but you know, we did it without it. We, we played 10 weeks of great football without Derrick Henry. Uh, we had Deontay Foreman running the ball, Hilliard, um, 
bunch of guys, you know, that were doing good, pro- a good productive work. And uh, yeah, I think they brought Henry back, relied a little too much on it. And uh, he absolutely should have been ready to play. But I think they uh, definitely put him into a situation that he was not ready to go hundred percent in. So, so we're in a situation where we had Ryan Tannehill as the German engineer that made a great car, but we needed somebody to invent a Tesla. Mm-hmm. And that that's where we were. Okay. So I'm going to ask one quick question and then another one that's going to lead us into the next topic. Um, what is AJ or not AJ Brown? What is Julio Jones contract situation? Was it a good idea to bring him in? And what's the remaining part of his tenure? Cause I know this was more than just uh, bring him in for this last season. Where, where are you at with that specifically? Yeah. Um, so I, I uh, <clears throat> I'm a little fuzzy on the details of his, his exact contract situation, but I, I do believe he is going to be coming back next year. And uh, a lot of people got really down on that deal uh, about midway through the season. You know, a lot of the typical complaints of oh, Julio's getting old, Julio's always hurt. You can't rely on him. Um, but at the end of the day, you know, who Julio Jones is, you know, he's a threat. And uh, if you don't respect that threat, then you are going to get beat by him. So uh, my my uh, look at uh, Julio Jones is that he is there to take a lot of heat off of A.J. Brown. And that is the reason that A.J. Brown went for 142 yards against the Bengals in the divisional round. Mm-hmm. Julio Jones still had six receptions for 60 plus yards. So. I think he absolutely has a place in this offense. Um, he's an elite wide receiver too. He's the most elite <laughs> wide receiver too there is in the game. And I don't think there's a better one out there. So. Okay. Fair enough. So here's my actual question. You dogged on the offensive coordinator quite a bit. So let's talk about the last offensive coordinator you had cram it in your cram hole of floor. Does this game go down differently if he's still running the Titans offense? You know, I got I, I don't know. That's a, that's a good question. Um, I think that there's a chance that it goes better. I mean, again, any given Sunday, anything can happen. Um, but yeah, I don't know. It's hard for me to make a judgment on how much LaFleur would have made a difference there. If uh, he would have been the key factor or not, you know, but. Mm-hmm. So let's get into that Packers Niners game. The, yeah. uh, Aaron Rodgers led Aaron Rodgers, who many people like Stephen A. Smith call a bad man, who many people around here that haven't soured on him, which is more than than you honestly think in the Wisconsin area, um, will say that he is the most talented physical specimen to play that offense led by Matt LaFleur, which, Chris, he does call the plays, right? I believe so, but I, I believe so sure. too. I, yeah. I believe that Aaron Rodgers calls about 50% of those plays. Sure, but it's not an offensive coordinator over the head coach. Or, no, or, I don't believe yeah, so. so that's, there you I don't go. believe that's, the and that's the point that we're getting at. Yeah, I might call I Aaron don't know Rodgers who the offensive offense. coordinator is for the Packers, but yeah. Yeah, nobody does. But so they yeah. scored 10 points. 10 points. I mean, my favorite yeah. stat of the week which is also of the playoffs because this is actually cemented. Travis Kelsey has more touchdown passes in the playoffs than Aaron Rodgers. Yeah, that's a great Travis stat. Kelsey it does the tight end of the Kansas city chiefs who did play quarterback in college has more <laughs> touchdown passes in the NFL postseason this year than Aaron Rodgers. Yes. And, and, and it's, and it's one of those, how, how do you mess that up? That Packers playoff game? How do you, how do you mess that up? How do you special not teams? You can special blame teams. it on the special teams as much. Aaron Rodgers doesn't have a touchdown pass in the playoffs. Yeah. But I mean, you had a punt blocked for a touchdown. You had a field goal blocked, I think right before the half. I mean, in a game like that, in a weather game, uh, I mean, yeah, granted that Aaron Rodgers and the Packers should be able to play in weather games, but still, I mean, it's the playoffs. It's hard It's hard to blow out teams in the playoffs. I, I don't care who you're playing. And, 
you can't you can't play that badly on special teams. That's why they lost to the Chiefs was because of special teams, you know, with Jordan Love. I mean, where's you know, they the Packers might have won that game with Jordan Love if not for special teams. It's just one of those things where you can't you can't have something like that holding you back. Now, if 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 you don't have those mistakes on special teams and you still score, you still lose that game 13 to 10 or 14 to 10. Um, then yeah, you can really put more of that on Rodgers. I'm not exonerating him by any points. I think he deserves every bit of criticism he gets for many reasons, but um still I that that I mean it's not like the 49ers did anything either in that game offensively. That's it. The Packers special teams were horrible. There's no mm-hmm. denying that. But you you cannot let that game get to special teams. You can't. This was sure. Jimmy Garoppolo versus Aaron Rodgers. Jimmy Garoppolo versus Aaron Rodgers. I, I'm going to recap a conversation that I had with my wife last night. She watches games. She is not anything that I would call a staunch football enthusiast. She likes being in the room with us when we watch our team win. She says constantly – you know, I don't, I don't get into sports because I don't like being stressed out and making myself stressed out. But she watches This Is Us. She likes to stress herself out in, this, in different ways. And it's fine. That, that, that's a that's a guy gal thing. It's uh, the, the healthy part of how life is and everything. Um, but she was talking yesterday or, or this morning. I don't remember. But she just goes, you know, tell me if I'm off base here, but I, I'm just kind of watching stuff. And it seems like Aaron Rodgers is getting older and he's not looking at stuff the way that he used to. And he's just making assumptions and you get to a point where things are going a certain way. And Anthony's whispering in my ear, he, he's getting crotchety. And the thing that's yeah. funny is every single national pundit is taking a, a take on, on that direction. And what they're saying is that Aaron Rodgers spent all of his time trying to cram the ball down the people that he trusted throat. And and so the real critiques on Rodgers, Mercedes Lewis got one target, which turned into a reception, which turned into a fumble and Rodgers wouldn't even look at him anymore. So think back to that SNL skit with Peyton Manning, where he puts the kid in the porta potty after he throws a football at him and he doesn't catch it. That's how Aaron Rodgers treated Mercedes Lewis. Call it what you will that was a real life version of that parody and she's sitting there saying all of these things. And so I listened to what she says and I'm just saying, you, you have no idea how on target you are and you know how to read a box score. Right. And she's like, well, yeah, you know, I've, I've looked at these before. I'm like, just look at the Packers box score, go to the wide receivers and tell me what you see. And she pretty immediately keys into the right column. And I just said, TGRT is targets. Look at the total number at the bottom and look at what Aaron Jones and uh, Devontae Adams Adams have. And that play where he feeds the ball to Devontae Adams when Alan Lazard was running across the middle of the field, a high school coach would chew out his quarterback and bench him for that crap. Mm -hmm. So it, it, it's insulting that you bring up special teams as a reason why the Packers lose that game when that play happened at the point where you're one throw away from being in field goal range, which apparently can be done in 13 seconds in two plays, shockingly. And no uh, guarantee with Mason Crosby, though, if you tell I, 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 and, and you know, and you know what? I understand I understand special that. teams still. I understand yeah. that. I would be more down with blaming Mason Crosby and special teams if he misses the field goal after you put him in position. Because the end of that game, you can sit there and say the weather was garbage. We weren't getting a lot of looks. Well, he was put in position though before the half, and the field goal got blocked. I mean, it's not like he didn't have an opportunity. Fair enough. I, yeah, I'm yeah. You're convincing me I may be being a little too hard on Rodgers, but no such thing. No, no. Uh, let me make it clear. You're not being too hard on him. Uh, I, I'm just saying, I guess I'm just saying straight out based on, uh, I mean, the, the thing that lost the game for the Packers was special teams, but um, a great quarterback 
and we, we talked about this all year with the Chiefs, covers up those those deficiencies. They, they, they expand the margin for error, and Aaron Rodgers sure as hell did not do that Saturday night. Well, and here's, here's a scenario, and, and this is the reality of where we are. If you're given a choice where you're told the difference between winning or losing is to stop a block punt and is it two missed field goals? Hell, I don't remember. So just say a block know. punt, missed field goal, or get an extra touchdown out of your quarterback. Which of those two in a vacuum are you picking? Well, and the, and the then touchdown from your quarterback. And then add the context where let, let's just be total d bag with the way that we're doing these rankings say a top 30 all-time quarterback. I don't think that you could find anybody that would argue that Rodgers is a top 30 all-time quarterback and you're saying find an extra touchdown. And without even looking at what the score is, you're going to say your quarterback needs to come up with an extra touchdown. And then you look at the box score and say, well, you need to go from zero to one. It's just horrible. (laughs) It's horrible. Yeah. No, I mean, my personal preference is to be control of my own fate, and I see that as being, you know, that most likely scenario, but I still, I mean. Don't mess up a block punt seems pretty easy. You, just, you shouldn't be able uh, to mess that up. Right. That, that's well, stuff you shouldn't you have to worry about. Is kicking a yeah. punt without having it knocked down. <laughs> yes, especially <laughs> in the playoffs. Uh, that, that's, stuff, that's stuff you shouldn't have to worry about, but, you know, right. it, it reared its head on them. But, it, you know. No, Aaron Rodgers, everything you say about Aaron Rodgers is warranted. You know, it's just, um, do I, do I think this should fall solely on him? No, because of that. But do I think that he should get criticism for not doing more because he should? That I mean, you want to be the NFL MVP, who, to be honest with you, I think should be Cooper Cup, not Aaron Rodgers or Tom Brady or any quarterback this year. I mean, that was his, and that's why I like, same thing with the Heisman Trophy. It's like, wait until after the championship before you give the Heisman Trophy or the the MVP. Or give it out after week 18. Well, yeah, and I always say, like, Vince Young, Vince Young (laughs) should have gotten the Heisman Trophy or Reggie Bush hands down. But, you know, we didn't get to actually see that play out until after the Heisman was given in the Rose Bowl. So, But if Reggie Bush went into that game as the Heisman Trophy winner, we're not talking about this. If it's a regular season award, give it out after the regular season, not after the postseason. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think uh, what we can uh, 100% agree on is that the uh, Packers were stupefyingly uh, underwhelming. It was incredibly disappointing. And once again, we're not going to get a year where our team is going to play against a local team, even though we've been threatening for it the past three seasons. No, I'm with you. Once again. Yeah, I'm with you. That was that was the one game I was the most surprised about because I I I even told someone they were just like, oh, I think the Forty Nineers. I'm like, no, it's not going to happen this year. Like the you know, it it just didn't seem plausible this year, but it happened. Well, and that's, that's the thing that's crazy is um, Rodgers and Mahomes have not played each other. Nope. And I don't know that we're ever going to get it. There's a not, talk of him going to the not Broncos, the Packers and Chiefs. Point, but yeah. Well, I mean, if he goes to the Broncos, yeah, we'll get it every couple of years. But, I mean, I'm just going to say this out loud. Rodgers goes to the Broncos. He's the third best quarterback in the division. <laughs> He plays like he did this last week, and he might be the fourth best. Because yeah. uh, it, it's kind of insulting to insult, insult uh, Derek Carr at this point. But uh, before we get off of this Packers game, I'm going to let Anthony, who is a Titans fan, but he grew up in Chicago, <laughs> bow out his favorite stat. Yes, yes. My favorite stat is now safe for another year. Uh, Aaron <laughs> Rodgers has won the same amount of NFC championships as Rex Grossman. Uh, 
one of the all-time great Bears quarterbacks, as we all know, since he won the same amount of NFC championships as Aaron Rodgers. Everybody thinks Aaron Rodgers is so great. So, And that is uh, something that I think of the same way that I think of when you hear about the Dolphins players that are still alive from the 72 team that break out cha- uh, champagne every year when the last undefeated team loses. It's good stuff. Yeah. Well, you know, my other, like my other favorite thing games. about you, yeah. you're all horrible people. I can't stand you. But anyway. <laughs> I was to say one more thing to cap off the uh, Niners-Packers uh, game is that I love that, you know, the Chicago Bears all-time top scorer, Robbie Gold, was the one that got to put the final nail in the car. That's right. Now, so, um. so that video, <laughs> that video at the end and Jimmy Garoppolo, all this talk was about how he had never played in an under 32 uh, degree game or something like that. The dude went to Northern Illinois or was it Western Illinois? Like, yeah, he's Eastern whatever. Illinois. What, what, whatever. Yeah. You could throw a rock and hit where he, yeah. he went to school. And I where he grew up from here. Yeah. Yeah. He it was played, the same school as Tony Romo. It was Eastern Illinois. Yeah. He played in some cold weather, and, and you guarantee that he did not grow up as a Packers fan. And and so I love yeah. that after Gold made that kick, Bears kicker Robbie Gold, um, Garoppolo walks up to him and just goes, hell yeah, F the Packers. <laughs> That's why we do all this stuff. Right. <laughs> you know? It's just <laughs> – I like the Packers. I was rooting for the Packers. I really wanted a Chiefs Packers Same Super Bowl. Here. I've been looking forward to it, but I mean that right there is poetic justice. And and you can't say that Aaron Rodgers isn't just a D bag at this point. So it's yeah, as uh, much as I like the Packers, I, I can't stand Aaron Rodgers. The more yeah. as the season has gone along, the less of a fan of him I've been. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And uh it yeah. It's just a combination of all the things. And uh, he, yeah. he's just a – he's the fountain of youth of reasons to not like somebody, which, yeah. is, which, which, which is unfortunate, you know. Fountain yeah. of youth of reasons to not like somebody. Yeah, you don't even have he's to – He's the Joe Rogan of the NFL, so you know. Hey. But, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Okay, well, so enough about that game. The Packers are done. Um, any friends we had in Wisconsin we might not have anymore or <laughs> – <laughs> might be, they might be even more galvanized because they agree with us and they're just like oh finally somebody said it out loud and and realistically speaking i think there's more of these somebody said it out loud than a lot of mm-hmm. the rest of the country would think yeah. that that's it okay so rams bucks we were a quarter away from not having anything to talk about and it was just going to be um, a simple narrative of Matthew Stafford has proven his weight, or pro- proven his worth, proven his value. You understand why the Rams gave up what they did. But then Tom Brady, almost Tom Brady. In fact, I would say that he did Tom Brady, but they just dug slightly too big of a hole for even Tom Brady. Uh, what were your thoughts on that game? Because I know that Anthony and I mm-hmm. – walked into a place to catch the the first part about that we were at a wedding show well, i was gonna say yeah like let's let's put this into perspective about how quick this comeback happened that it was something like 27 to what 10 or something like it was 27 to 3, three. Mm-hmm. or it was or it was 20 to 3 we walk into bar to, to a bar to grab a bite to eat we leave and right. it's maybe 27 to 10 and we're we're in the car driving to where we were going and and right i'm talking we're we're covering four linear miles within a city right <clears throat> and it's uh it's a thing where <clears throat> the game's a humiliation you see brady's bloody lip right then mm-hmm. all of a sudden it's 2027 20, right oh crap my phone hung up the internet's being weird holy crap it's 27 27 they're going to overtime right. yeah i just remember turning it was like oh my god it's 27 to 20 you need to punch it we need to get to buffalo wildlands right now like yeah it went from being a who cares if we get there on time to no we need to get there to see how this happens so. well and more and more than anything it was a it was a game that was the fourth thought you assume that brady was going to beat stafford because stafford doesn't win anything and yep. <laughs> you uh see the score is just crooked you, you don't care because Stafford's beating Brady and it 
doesn't really matter. And then all of a sudden it's a incredibly compelling game. Mm-hmm. I mean, did you have a different experience with that? Did you, did you watch it any differently? It, it, no, it, it, was I, a, it was a weird game. It was hard to follow. Well, it takes me almost a half hour to drive from our, our place to Buffalo Wild Wings. So I actually had no idea what happened for about 30 minutes. And when I walked in, I was surprised to see that the Bucks were actually, you know, 10 yards away from tying the game. I thought that game was over, even though, you know, I expected Matt Stafford to Stafford. But, um, but yeah, I, um, I, I, I thought that game was over. I thought the Rams had that work. I actually had thought they had that wrapped up. I like how you say surprised and not shocked. Mm-hmm. Nobody was shocked. We were surprised. No, it's still Tom Brady, man. It's we still shocked, Tom Brady. Right. Pleasantly yep. surprised. Which, which is why I thought the Bucks were going to win. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, credit credit to the Rams. And for what it's worth, jumping a little ahead on the, the, the preview portion, I don't see a world where we don't have the Rams hosting a Super Bowl. We never had a team playing a Super Bowl in their home stadium until last year. Right. And now we're going to get it twice in a row from the same conference. It's just, it's weird. Cause I do believe that the uh, Rams get past this Niners hump. I don't care what kryptonite they've been. The Rams just had a galvanizing win against the V world beater, the goat, you know, that, that situation. So I don't see a world where they lose to the 49ers, but at the same time, I didn't see a world where the Packers lost to the 49ers either. Right. And right. here we are. Here hey, we are. I see a world. Um, I think it's a coin flip between those two teams, but that's sure. That's me. And I'll uh, just say that I'm not looking to go out and spend money on that game. <laughs> Yeah. No betting on that game. Not yeah. A lot of that's because gambling is not legal in Wisconsin, but yep. it's nothing 70 miles can't deal with. Okay, right. so next uh, next thing we need to get into is the most exciting game of the oh, weekend. Yeah. The another game, right? Yeah. One that I picked correctly, <laughs> which I I'm I'm still I'm still in awe of that situation and how that whole thing played out because this has been a year of superlatives and what I think is funny is all these different um, talking heads on TV are saying we just watched the best game that I've ever seen and I said that about the Chargers Raiders and I honestly cannot think of a game that was more riveting exciting compelling all of those things and then you add on all the all the stakes that outdoes what this last weekend was i mean this is crazy that game the chiefs and the bills decided in regulation it's maybe a little bit better but you know the nfl wants clicks and mentions and things of that more so i'm not sure that this this wasn't really the ideal situation because we're still talking about that game Mm -hmm. halfway through the week and not even really previewing any of the stuff that's coming up this weekend uh, that that game was just so riveting, exactly what the NFL wanted. Two of the hugest stars on the hugest stage going down to the absolute wire. Anybody could do it. What else did you say about that game? No, I mean, it lived up to expectations and then some. Um, I think for me, as far as putting it in perspective, I think we need to see how the rest of the playoffs – uh, play out before we can start to, to I, I mean I've heard a lot of people trying to rank it um, I think it's I think the the story still has to be written over this week and you know hopefully the Super Bowl as well you know I I was saying leading up to this game I still feel this way that I think the two best teams in the NFL played that night and I, I think whoever won that game is probably going to win the Super Bowl um, but, you know, it's, it's kind of like, you know, you ask the question, what well, can you think of a better game? It's like, well, you can if you want to. But, you know, if the Chiefs actually go on and win the Super Bowl, I think that, that probably puts a little bit more weight 
on this victory. It's always one of these things where you probably need a, at least a year to look back on and then really let it breathe. Cause you know, I mean, there, there's some recency bias there in it, but not to shortchange the actual game itself, not trying to compare it. I mean, that was incredible. I mean, that, that was one of the most emotional roller coasters that I can remember being on as a, as a fan since, and this was actually a really good comparison that got brought up. Um, I think it was on by our, our friends over in Arrowhead Pride. They had brought up the, uh, the Kansas Memphis game. I was just going to say that KU yeah. Memphis national championship game. Oh, yes. wait. <laughs> yeah. I think it was, I think Steven Serta and Rocky um, brought this up and they were talking about, you know, it's like they were down by nine, you know, with a minute 50. It's like, and I remember my wife asking me, she's like, has anybody ever come back from nine down, like less than two minutes? I'm like, Duke beat North Carolina. Not that I can like think that. of. Yeah. Not, not in the national well, championship. Game, no, but yeah. I'm just like, not that I can think of, but I guess anything's possible. And then you fast forward to Sunday night. Has anybody driven from their own 25 with 13 seconds to get their kicker within reasonable field goal range? I mean, it wasn't like Harrison Bucker was lining up for – you know, a, a 60 yarder. I mean, that was, you know, that, that was a combination of Andy Reid and Patrick Mahomes just showing that they, there, there's nobody else in the NFL that can do that than the combination of those two um, actually accomplishing that feat. And they did it within 10 seconds, let's be real, not 13. But that was, that was incredible. So great call on that. KU 2008 thing I want to throw out one one comment here that, that you're kind of alluding to so what we have to find out based on how the Chiefs finish this season is is this the 73 and 9 Warriors or the 72 and 10 Bulls because you can argue you can argue about um, the uh the accomplishment versus versus the way that it, that it ended out and if we if we don't go and win the Super Bowl right now, we're the seventy three and ten or nine Warriors. I would closing go it out as a seventy two and, and and ten bowl. I I mean, doesn't I mean, sound like you're you're vibing with me on this, but <laughs> no. Well, the Chiefs were twelve and five, and not you know seventeen and one sure, or sure. seventeen and yeah, zero. Yeah. But but yeah, I, I see where you're going with that though. Yeah. All right. So. Other thing I want to throw out. So we have MK Chiefs fan group. I know where I was, you know, through that entire game. I got an idea of where you were through that entire game. Mm -hmm. We had the most of the band back together. So, Anthony, you watched this game with us. You had no real dog in the fight. So I want you to describe what did you see in that last two minutes of the game and 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 getting in the overtime i mean overtime was overtime the coin was flipped i think everybody knew how it was going to go right it, it was a foregone conclusion bill cower during the halftime analysis said whoever has the ball last is going to win this that's what chris put in the writer's room so let's just make that assumption so i i want to know what you as a we won't call it truly neutral third party but about as close as we were going to get what did you see in that room i saw um excitement i saw disappointment i saw confidence and i saw absolutely broken men um and then i saw them put the pieces back together and i was really happy um i think i made the comment after that was all over that i think i just really needed a cigarette um it was just really stressful to watch like you know ben affleck leaning against a back alley like just the worst feeling, but the best feeling because man, I needed a breath. Um, that was a tight game for sure. So when Josh Allen hit Gabriel Davis for that fourth touchdown mm -hmm. with 13 seconds left, did you see anything that looked like hope between then and the time that the uh, first pass was completed to get halfway to the field goal range? Uh, I would say pretty much not. No, it was a lot of just crossed arms and uh, like head rolls, trying to like eye the screen, but not really look at it. <laughs> um, it was 
a sense of dread and doom. And uh, how could we have done this after just coming back and getting back in the league? Um, yeah, it just that kind of emotional roller coaster really messes with you. And uh, I, I don't know what's going to be able to top it, you know? So Chris Porter is a comedian from Shawnee, Kansas, mm-hmm. huge Chiefs fan, huge Royals fan. He has uh, a bit where he talks about how women have the most broad range of emotions and they watch shows that make them cry. Right. And it's their emotional CrossFit and they, they do stuff like that. But guys deal in three emotions. It's happy, mad, and confused. And he goes, uh, you want to see somebody go through all of those in about 20 seconds? Watch your man when he's watching his team lose the big game. He's going to go through all three of them really quickly because it'll be something just like, F, what happened? What happened? We were so good. What happened? What happened? It's just like, it was a good year. It was a good year. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, I, I could feel myself going through that. I, I can't remember if I said this out loud, but I remember at the very least thinking, we have 13 seconds. They just got to get in the field goal range, a couple of long passes. And I think we have, we have, we have three timeouts. I'd like to think I wasn't shocked that they did that, uh, which by the way, that, that audio with Travis Kelsey and oh, yes. Patrick Mahomes just being the smartest people in the entire freaking stadium uh, orchestrating how that was going to go is just goddamn genius. It, it's incredible. Um, but, but yeah, I mean, I was, I was in the process of thinking through those three emotions because I 100% think, think that bit is correct. Um, we deal in three emotions, happy, confused, and uh, upset. <laughs> I was going to say, I think, too, that, you know, if you were in that room and if you told me that you didn't honestly think for at least half a second that the season was over, you were delusional. I mean, that was... I thought it for at least the highest, a of, the highest of highs and the lowest of lows, man. I'm telling you, like it was crazy. Well, especially because that play happened on a fourth and 13, you know, fourth and 13 in, in your head is, I don't care how horrible our defense is. <laughs> uh, <laughs> we, ain't, uh, we ain't giving up a touchdown here. Right. And you know, the guy there roasted you three other times. Worst, so, right. worst, yeah. worst case scenario. Yeah they pick up this first down and we have to make them run another play, you yep. know? And, and at that point, I mean, it was fourth and 13 from the 25, right? Yeah. It was around that, that place. Yeah. Yeah. R- roughly that. Yeah. I mean, this, this wasn't a one yard <laughs> touchdown pass. This wasn't a Josh Allen runs it in. This right. wasn't a King Henry, you know, close it or, or the one that I know Chris and I remember Larry Johnson going for it on fourth and one as time expired to, hit the three-point shot against the Raiders. This was just soul-crushing. You took twice as many yards as you were going for and entitled to, and it was just completely opportunistic. But um, all's well that ends well. Last thing I want to talk about that game. Have you done your uh, $13 for the Children's Hospital? No, I need to do that. Yeah, I'm doing that tonight as well. That's I'm, that's pretty incredible. What it really is, it really the is. Chiefs Kingdom has done to to donate to that cause. And but yeah, exactly. There, there's assholes in every stadium yeah. section. I, I'm 100 percent convinced of that. But yep. as a whole, I really do think that Chiefs fans are a good group of people. Bills fans are a good group of people. Help most enough. Most most professional sports fans in the U.S. are good groups of people. I have been a fan of the opposing team in I'm going to, I'm going to throw out 50 stadiums because I really think that number is accurate. I've, I've, I've traveled a bit in my life and I can't think of more than one situation where I really felt like there was a threat of things going somewhere too far. And I'll, I'll tell that story here real quick. So the, uh, the Andrew Luck uh, picked up the fumble, 45 44 yeah i was at that game and so that game would have been when i had a nine month old daughter so my daughter was nine months old at that point and so we we go down to indianapolis we do that we had a nice time we sit down in our seats 
we're in the end zone and we sit in front of this just worthless trailer trash group of yahoos that come in in front of us they call them colts fans yeah exactly so there you go i mean (laughs) these people were hammered they had blue tongues because they were taking all these shots and ftc by the way and 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 so that and so they sit down and uh they're just like oh, you know, if the Chiefs is really, i can't believe they let you guys in here and it's just like eh, go away you know and, and so what i found being a fan in the the opposing stadium don't stand up and try to show people up you can cheer for your team and yeah. and just be cool that's really it you know it, it's well, and thing. i'll i'll say this i i've been that fan and i didn't realize how big of an asshole i was until I moved away and yeah, yeah it's i mean come on it's it's exactly you know, so we're yeah. so where things start to go sideways jamal charles got hurt early in that game and you know i'm sitting there going like ah oh, man and there's one dude in front of us and he stands up and he's just like oh yeah your running back went down it's just like yeah he's like clapping in my face and stuff <laughs> that ain't cool at all He's like, what are you talking about? Your running back went down. And just like, dude, that, that's not that's not cool. Um, that would be like me telling you that I hope Andrew Luck tears his ACL, drop him back for a pass. And he keeps just doubling down on the whole thing. And I'm just like, okay, well, I guess here we are. I hope Aaron, I hope uh Andrew Luck, you know, blows his knee out and can't play all next season. I'm like, I guess that's where we're at. And and so he kind of calms down again, and and then the Chiefs are just up and we're not being jerks and and we're hanging out with a baby, you know, let's be clear about that too. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, um, you know, it gets to the point where the Colts, I think got one touchdown to make it 38 to 17. And this guy still keeps saying stuff. And you know, my wife who, you know, well, and, mm-hmm. and know how off brand this is. She finally just goes, good God, why don't you just shut the F up? And he starts getting really just obnoxious and his girlfriend smacks him on the back of the head and just goes, dude, stop it. We're trying to watch a football game. And these guys are like blackout, you know, buying beers every time the beer guy comes by and he just goes, Oh, I'm sorry. Well, she told me to shut the F up. And then this lady turns around and, and, and proves just how much of a low life she is. And she's just like, she told you to shut the F up. And, and, and they start getting aggressive and and i mean we're literally sitting right behind these people and this is in the middle of a 20 seat row and i'm just sitting here going is, is this really where we're at is this seriously what we're doing and and so i see this guy because we're rolling into the third quarter as the colts are coming back and i just hear him muttering under his uh his breath he's just like it's my time you know my time's coming in the fourth quarter he's like i'm not tolerating this this is going to happen this is my time and I'm sitting here going, <clears throat> you know, I haven't been in a fight since, you know, middle school on the school bus. <laughs> and uh, I'm twice this guy's size. Am I going to, am I going to be throwing somebody down a row of stands and breaking their neck to keep them from hurting my nine month old daughter? I'm like, this is insane. What am I doing here? You know? And, and I'm looking at it going like, is this a glass bottle? Can I break it off? I'm like, what, what are we doing? You know? And then thankfully when the uh, Colts got within one touchdown, these guys just got up and left, you know, it was to a point where I, they, they were just so goddamn drunk that they finally got up and left. And it's just like, <sighs> the, you know, the whole time I'm looking at the entire stands and I'm just going, okay, this is 75% chiefs fans we're holding a nine month old. (laughs) This, this isn't, this isn't going to go where this guy thinks it's going to go, but that, that is hands down the worst experience that I've had sitting in fans and uh, sitting in stands. And uh, I went to the chiefs game in Philadelphia where Donovan McNabb was put in the ring of honor. And this was the first or second year that Reed was in town from Philadelphia and Jamal Charles, you know, won that game at the end. And being in Philly and rooting for the opposing team was less of a problem than than Indianapolis. So long way of saying that I generally think fans are good, but it just takes one yeah. useless individual to ruin it for everybody. 
every fan base has its pocket of assholes. I mean, you can try and say, well, this, this fan base is worse than the other, but it just takes a few assholes to basically smear a bunch of exactly. people. Exactly. And that's what's frustrating. Yep. No, a ton of nice Raiders yeah. fans. Yeah. I have Raiders fans in my family. <laughs> yeah. I keep telling them they make medicine for stuff like that, but they aren't fixing it. Anyway, um, so let's get into <laughs> the, the rest of the stuff we have. So uh, any uh, any stats that you like this week? I think I threw mine out. Uh, Travis Kelsey, one touchdown pass in this playoff uh, run. Aaron Rodgers, zero. Yeah, I mean – 25 points were scored in the last two minutes of the game. I don't think that's ever happened in a playoff game. Good stat. (laughs) And uh, from what I know, no team has driven from their own 25 with 13 seconds on the clock and tied up the game with a field goal. So, uh, yeah, even better stat. Anthony, any stats? Uh, So, I got to say I love the box uh, stats uh, for uh, the Tennessee Titans. Uh, 200 yards receiving – 150 yards rushing you'd have thought we'd won that game especially with nine sacks but we didn't so that's fine. nine <laughs> sacks. Nine, nine, nine we sacked him nine to- nine times nine i'm looking times. at it right now nine, nine times yes. uh the other one that i liked um i think it's uh 120 passer ratings let me see if i can just pull this up this is a stat thing that um somebody threw on social media so let's see here da, 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 da. um not gonna make anybody look too long on this but in, in any event patrick mahomes has four or five games where he's got 120 passer rating in the playoffs and he's matching tom brady and joe montana he's beating peyton manning and josh allen is it something like yeah. three well, he, so, he moved up into 12th all time in passing touchdowns in the playoffs, and he's in his fourth playoff. I mean, correct. Yeah. Correct. Yeah, and, and that's it. I mean, there there is not a player who has changed the direction of a franchise quicker and more aggressively. Okay, so here it is. Um, this is, let's see here. Most career postseason games with a passer rating of 120 or higher minimum 20 pass attempts. I don't even know why you have to throw that qualifier out there when you see what the list is. So with five, Brady Montana Mahomes. With four, Peyton Manning Aaron Rodgers. With three, Troy Aikman, Brett Favre, Kurt Warner, Josh Allen. Now. How the hell did Troy Aikman make it on there? Troy Aikman was incredibly efficient, so – uh, bite your tongue you know this yeah it's, 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 uh, <laughs> passer ratings are more about efficiency than actual exactly power. exactly i mean that it, it, it's the most messed up equation that you can look at i mean i remember it taking is. calculus classes and uh the the whole thing is based on it, it's less about volume which is why they're throwing the 20 pass attempts because oh, yeah. for all rights and purposes travis kelsey's got one of these because he threw the ball one time and he right. scored a touchdown. So he's well, I'm got sure it. many of those games, Troy Aikman probably threw 20 passes, but yeah. Yeah, because what is it? 156.5 is the top end because that's a number that makes sense. But 156.3, um, but yeah. Yeah, there you go. Yeah. So, so that number. 58.3, but yeah. There Sorry. you go. So you get, uh, you get penalized way more for failing than anything. Mm-hmm. And Mm -hmm. if you, and and I want to say that they even have it built in where if you throw the ball away, it only takes away half as much as if you throw an incompletion. But in in any event, I, I spent a, I spent a three month period of time, one football season. This was before the chiefs were good and I didn't have anything to do just digging into what that stat was and what affected it. And, uh, I probably should have written an essay about it. And I might have in college, but in, in, in any event, it, it's uh, it's weird. But what I think that we can all agree with is that um, you know anything between ninety and hundred means that you had a decent enough day. Anything between a hundred and a hundred and ten means you had a pretty good day. Anything above a hundred and ten, you probably put your team in a position to win. And when you're hitting the hundred and twenty you're you're getting into the stuff went pretty well for you and uh you know i'll be the first to say that we're looking at different eras 
there's a there's a time and place there's what the quarterbacks are allowed to do there's how much play offenses have you know all that stuff that goes into it Mahomes and Brady played in close enough to the same era that I think that we can compare mm-hmm. that um that Joe Montana number is just impressive is uh, oh, yeah. is the other takeaway um and, and and then I think that that Troy Aikman three is impressive as well so the three numbers that jump out are how quickly Mahomes put himself at the top, how quickly Josh Allen has put himself into the conversation, and just Joe Montana and uh, Troy Aikman. There you go. So there you go. Troy Aikman, yeah. Weak as a song. What do you got? Yeah. Um, so when things get grim, don't fear the reaper. Or sorry. I just gave away my song title. When things get grim, uh, you got a fever. <laughs> you got a fever. But uh, yeah, be the grim reaper. And I actually, I posted this on Bleacher Report. I said, the uh, the Blue Oyster Colts got it all wrong. You absolutely should fear the reaper. So don't fear the reaper is my song of the week. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that that song is is funny to me. And yeah. I know you spent a lot of time around music, so... I, I don't have to tell you what that song is about by any means. Um, it, it, it's always funny to me when people will take songs out of context and the two that I'll throw out the, that I think are the most humorous um, Ronald Reagan, when he was campaigning and, and <laughs> you can be a Reagan fan or not be a Reagan fan, but he took the Bruce Springsteen song born in the USA. And I mean, that, that that's, that's a top, like, foot and mouth situation that's ever come down and bruce springsteen's like do you know how to listen to these lyrics um uh, the other the other yeah. one that i'll throw out my dad cannot stand when people don't listen to lyrics to songs and his example and and this came from a, a place where i could tell that he was just really triggered by this because he's a he's a good vocalist and so he would sing in his high school and college choirs and he would get um, tapped on to sing at weddings and being in the wedding service industry, I can tell you stuff that's changed. Um, 20 years ago when I started in Western Kansas, at the very least uh, 99.9% of weddings happened in churches. And I even saw this trend kind of change during the first couple of years, the way that you put this whole thing together is you have the, the pastor or priest at whatever parish, church, congregation, whatever you want to call it, you were at. And they would tell you how the schedule was going to go. And they would have their music director who was a piano or organ player who would say, you know, I'm going to do these things. And you would be able to bring your own vocalist in to sing a song. And that was one of the major decisions that you had to make where I grew up for your wedding is who's going to be the vocalist. And, you know, to, who can you line up? Who can you afford to have? You know, everybody had their wish list of who would be the vocalist, but you would bring people in to sing. Um, you know, now Anthony and I are wedding DJs. We just play music off our, <laughs> off our computers and we run this stuff. And that's, that's just how the trends have gone. But my dad was a vocalist at weddings and the song that he just abhorred singing Olivia Newton, John had this song called, I honestly love you. And the whole song is about, um, I honestly love you, but I'm going to break up because I want to have an affair and I want to break up before I have an affair. And I, I want to say that's what the, the lyrics are. This isn't a good song. So it's not like I'm going out and listening to it or anything like that. But um, you know, he, Anytime he would give an example of somebody not paying attention to what a song was about, that was it. And uh, my favorite one, when I was DJing weddings back in Kansas, that would pop up, George Strait has a song, You Look So Good in Love, and it's a waltz. It's a perfect three, four time. It's probably one of the easiest songs to waltz to. But the whole thing is, we broke up because I wasn't paying attention and you look so good in love with this other guy and people would pick this for their wedding song. Yeah. So my, yeah. my favorite example, uh, so I'm a Pearl Jam fan, but the mm-hmm. one that always gets brought up is better man. Yeah. So if you, if you've ever listened to the lyrics of better man, you know, this, the meaning behind this uh, song, better man, it essentially is basically saying Eddie Vedder's mom, who uh, uh, ended up 
leaving his dad because she couldn't find a better man uh, that was basically the meaning behind the song is this woman's in an abusive relationship and she can't uh, separate herself from it. So, but a lot yeah. of people will dance to that song. It's kind of like, no, <laughs> yeah. Well, what do you think it is? <laughs> well, another, another one that I really like um, there, there's this country song called uh, let it rain. I mean, this, the song's a banger. David nails a hell of a singer. Uh, the, the whole thing is uh, you cheat you're overwhelmed with guilt so you tell her about it she throws you out of the house that happens to be raining and she throws all your shit out the window and so you're standing there getting rained on and your whole thing is like let it rain let it pour and it's just like that's that's not a that's not good um you know one that i've thrown out the the chiefs have beaten the broncos they've, they've swept them seven years in a row so i do the seven year rake you know seven year rake uh johnny cash's daughter roseanne cash uh, yeah. sang that song and I want to say it was Rodney Crowell who was a writer and who was her husband and a producer but there's the whole thing of the the seven-year itch and and part of it is that the biological theory is that you turn all your cells over every single year as a human being and so every seven years you're a different person than before so it's uh, logically fitting that in a seven-year period of time you're going to think and act differently and you might not get along with the same people that you did. So you're trying to uh, prevent that seven year itch, which is the, the, the thing where people that have affairs have them after seven years, apparently, I, I don't know. To yeah. me, it's, it's one of those, yeah, they're, you're either wired that way or you're not, you know, <laughs> but, uh, but so it's a seven year ache, the seven year itch, but, she has the song you know, are you trying to stop the seven year ache <laughs> and it's a song that was a country chart topper it's like cool you people have no idea what the hell you're listening to nope. first thing. anyway so i'll go to my song um i've noticed uh two things this week everybody's acknowledging that we might have watched the greatest football game ever i understand there's a recency bias but like murder this is a time and place you know crime that we're dealing with right now and that game was awesome mm -hmm. that game was that game was great it was two quarterbacks at the top of their field it was just everything that the nfl wanted it to be it was perfect for tv and the only real hole that you can poke into it is that it ended with the uh, coin flip and overtime and everything like that. And so the thing that I'm happy is being brought up in this mist of, well, this isn't fair. Josh Allen didn't get a touch the ball. Is there is enough yeah, people bringing river. up the fact that the Chiefs are not potentially going to a fourth Super Bowl in a row because we were put into that situation against Tom Brady. And so the part that I take exception to is everybody sitting here going like, oh, it was fine with Brady. Nobody was upset about it. Uh, plenty of people were pissed off about it. It was more or less received as well as the Chiefs winning this one was. You had your 50% that was saying, hey, the rules are the rules. You know, nobody's sprung this on you as overtime was happening. And the other half saying, we need to change that. Well, the Chiefs, put in a rule change to change that. And I'm, I'm so glad that this is getting called out. Yeah. The Chiefs put in to change that. And everybody said no. And, and Andy uh, redoubled down on it. And the semantic yeah. argument is that, well, you know, there wasn't enough support, so it didn't go to a vote. Okay, so that really means that everybody said no. Right. Because yep. I, have, I have an impossible time believing that if Rooney, Mara, Jerry Jones, if one of those three would have said, F this, we're never letting this happen again, that we would have been uh, voting on that and it would have had a chance to pass. And Andy Reid saying, <clears throat> I would be open to changing that rule. So my song for this week is uh, The Hives, Hate to Say I Told You So. Because that <laughs> song has this just smug, I, I don't hate to tell you this at all, I told you so. And that's it. I hate to say that I told you so. I, we told you this is going to be a problem. Told you this is going to be a problem. And the only real vindication that Chiefs, players, fans, everybody has 
is that we've been on both sides of this coin. I feel bad for the Bills. I really do. Um, I'm glad that this whole charity thing is happening because it is two really good fan bases. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it, it just the, the, the solution simple. The uh, arguments that I, I listened to, my favorite rant that I've seen on TV, Jeff Saturday got out and just said, I am not interested in this conversation. The rules are the rules. Everybody has this whole recency bias and situation that they think of. And the reason that you can't sit there and just extend this is these guys all have to play again next Sunday. You know, what are you going to do? Play three 15 minute quarters after you played four of them. This is stupid. Just, it needs to be over. And I don't know that I quite go as far as he does, but in the spirit of things, I think that makes perfect sense. That being said, one of my favorite internet memes that I saw in the, uh, the Facebook world this week was the uh, Chiefs and Bills follow college overtime rules. And after FOT 19, the score is 119 yeah. to 156 or something right. stupid like yeah. that. Yeah, that was that, my favorite too. That really might have been where we were going. And that really could have been the, the level of – crazy that that score could have run up to could have been but it's a classic we won the uh we won the toss yeah josh allen was nine and oh calling the toss on the road or something like that and he he finally <laughs> missed one and if you if you need a better example of we have so many people in this country that need something to do just look up all the different sports pundits that are criticizing josh allen for picking heads yeah (laughs) (laughs) it's just it's just could have done more exactly 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 it's just you you, that reminds me of exactly my review i got at one time you really (laughs) really really need a hobby you went above and beyond for your team but you could have done more (laughs) exactly so what he's what he's alluding to uh (laughs) we, we work in the wedding service industry i i run a wedding service company and Anthony's a guy who DJs with me all the time. He's incredible at his job. He got a review one time where this bride types out, yeah, yeah everything was good, we had a fun dance or whatever. The DJ was good. He could have done more. It's like, what, what the hell am I supposed to do? <laughs> I was supposed to that? Also after I like <laughs> sit exactly. down with them for dinner, you know, exactly, the day exactly, before, which I never do, and exactly, um, exactly, you know, <laughs> white glove service, making her play, getting her drinks, all that stuff, and it's just, exactly. Like, I look back on that stuff and laugh though, you know? exactly. So, and I'm just sitting here going, uh, "You guys have fun, yeah, yeah. You guys have fun. I don't think you ever have in your life, but you guys have fun, yeah." <laughs> Uh, I, you know, I, I think the overtime rule needs to change, you know, and just says, yeah, we've been on both sides of it. I, I'm not going to go into what my thoughts are on what they should do. Cause I think that would probably put us on for another 15 minutes, but I, I do think I there needs to be a change. To be. <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to get to bed at some point tonight, but yeah. <laughs> um, but, but no, it needs to change. I mean, I don't know how many times this has to come up for it to do so, but uh, I hope it does. Here's my biggest reason why I think we should change. We added a seventh team. Mm-hmm. There's, there's an extra, what, it, it would be two extra playoff which, games, right? Which around the corner is going to be an eighth. Um, well, exactly, Mark, exactly, exactly. We talked with Mark about that last week, but yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And we had a we had a season this year, and I've definitely gone on the record saying you don't make a rule for the exception. The seven seeds were a a complete embarrassment this year Mm -hmm. on the field in the game. In ratings, they were great. The Chiefs, Steelers, which you could say this is the Chiefs and the Steelers, but the Chiefs and the Steelers were one of the highest rated wild card games mm-hmm. we're, we're we're gonna lose this saying that's not a good idea we just are right and the god there should be a rule that you could never have a losing team win a division the seahawks beat the uh saints right and yeah, set yeah, off the richter scale so. in seattle but i just think about <clears throat> 
in the NFC side of things, the Eagles as a seven seed weren't any good. But the Niners as a six seed were really good. So that's a great agree that that's a great argument for we should be at nine or at uh, six teams only still. I don't remember who the eighth best team in the NFC was. But are you are you I telling are are you telling me that the Eagles couldn't have knocked off the Packers the way they played against the 49ers? Are you telling me that whoever barely missed out based on them couldn't have knocked off the Packers? We're we're gonna be in a situation sooner than later where there aren't any buys. There's eight teams, and within five years of that playoff format rolling out, we're gonna be seeing number one seeds go down on the first weekend. And just think about the number one seeds that we had. You have an Aaron Rodgers that just doesn't care and is uninspired. You know, let's say an inspired – I'm going to see if I can pull up the the, um, standings here right now, regular season standings, because I'm actually really intrigued by this. Oh, you're trying to figure out who the eight seeds would be? Yeah, I'm trying to figure out who the uh, eight seed would be. Okay, so – on the Chiefs page, my internet's being slow. Um, okay, so standings, looking at the playoff. So the eight seed for the AFC would be the Colts this year. Dolphins nine, Chargers ten, because they fell really, really far. Uh, the Saints Browns, on the Browns eleven, Ravens twelve. Holy crap! Okay, so yeah, the Saints would have been the eight seed. You're telling me that you cannot visually picture Anthony earmuffs, the uh, Colts knocking off the Titans in the first weekend and the Saints knocking off the Packers. We could have in the very first year, if they had eight teams, seen two eight seeds win. And I honestly think that those games would have been more likely this year than the Eagles and the uh, and the and the Steelers because those teams oh, both yeah, snuck yeah. in. I mean, we had a weird situation by by adding that seventh team. We put teams that didn't deserve to be there, and we left the dangerous teams in the eight and nine positions out. <laughs> you know, the uh, the the Saints could have gone in and rolled the Packers by two touchdowns. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, yeah it, it's it's going to expand again. It's just like, you know, college football, too. I mean, there's there's more money to be made by adding more teams and more games. Right. It's going to happen. The thing that's funny is I don't necessarily think that adding the seventh team was smart, but the NFL is brilliant. Mm-hmm. I 100 percent think building up on the college football playoff is smart, but the NCAA is dumb. Oh, yeah. In a lot of ways, I consider they're NCAA. dumb, but they'll come to their senses at some point. It's, yeah. it's going to happen. And, yeah. and NCAA football is nearing a, a realm of unwatchable for me. Just it's gotten there for me based on how they put stuff, and uh, this will make this take an extra hour. I, I'm I'm there with baseball too. I'm kind of starting to hate that sport, <laughs> but anyway. Um, yeah, I think we need to wrap theme. this up before we get into yeah, that yeah. topic. Yeah. So, good night, Chiefs Kingdom. David Ortiz making it in, but yeah. Exactly. Anyway. So, yeah. Uh, um. <laughs> I, def- I definitely think when we get into the off season and the 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 luster of this season rubs off, we need to start getting into baseball because I I'm I'm really just fed up with that sport as a whole with how stuff's going and i i feel like you're in the same place and i want to talk about it so Mm -hmm. anyway uh good night chiefs kingdom um thanks to titans anthony for being here with us hey i got nothing else going on this weekend (laughs) (laughs) so we'll we'll, we'll be we'll be an arrowhead joe burrow in passing made a comment about uh the sec being louder for stadiums and find some of that out this week so Anyway, we will uh, be back um, this next week and uh, hopefully talking about a Super Bowl. So hopefully have a uh, good night, Chiefs Kingdom. Chiefs. Tighten up.